Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. I can. Awesome. Yeah, fine. Thanks, guys. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this seminar in our Labor Studies seminar series. The Labor Studies seminar series is coordinated by the Neil Agate Labor Studies Unit at Rhodes University in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. Uh, we're named after Dr. Neil uh, Hudson Agate, who was a trade unionist, who was brutalized, beaten, tortured in prison, and who died uh, in an apartheid jail. This series is part of our ongoing work to engage with labor studies in the broadest sense. With that in mind, we partner in doing so with the Department of Sociology and Industrial Sociology at the University, as well as economics and economic history. I'd also like to thank our uh, funders for this particular program, which is the Frederick Herbert Stuftung in South Africa. Um, I see Dr. Moyo, Mbusa Moyo is here, and I believe um, uh, he will uh, also be giving a paper later in the, in the series. So when we do labor studies here, we do them in the broadest sense. These are not necessarily narrow studies of labor markets. We look at issues of policy, we look at issues of labor history, we look at issues of labor strategy and debate. So it's in this broad sense that we run a labor study seminar series. And if you're interested in being put on our mailing list, if you are not already so, please just put your name and an email in the uh, chat box and we'll capture that. It's very nice to see such a broad mix of people here. I can see some uh, postgrad students from the university, some colleagues. I can see people from NUMSA, from Kasatu, from various NGOs. Um, we've got uh, a, a comrade here from Nigeria, from um, Precious, from Otua, and there's a wide range. So if I haven't got your name, uh, I apologize. Uh, Marcus Solomon from the Children's Resource Center Cape Town. It's a nice mix. Well, without further ado, I want to first mention our next seminar will be on 6 October. We all have Professor Mike Rogan, and Mike will be looking on the 6th October at COVID-9, precarity, and the changing South African labor market, really how the pandemic has intersected with pre-existing patterns um, in the country of inequality, of um, cheap labor, and the reproduction essential of cheap labor system. So that's something to look forward to. What we will do now is I'm gonna introduce Janet and her topic, and then Janet will give her presentation. And after that, we'll take questions. You can put questions either in the chat box or you can um, put up a hand and uh, we'll, we'll uh, give you the mic, so to speak. We'll take a batch of questions, two or three, then Janet can respond and we'll go in that uh, order. I'm just gonna share screen so we can have the poster for this, if I've got it handy. Um, no, I don't. All right. Janet is going to be talking about cooperatives. And as she, she will point out a bit later, the question of energy in South Africa, access to electricity and other basic services remains a very contentious one. What, what's interesting as well is the question of what we do in a society based on massive structural unemployment and what we do in a world that is based on increasing inequality. If you've been following the, the figures, um, billionaires actually got richer in the pandemic while many people got poorer. For example, I was reading yesterday, I think 20% uh, of Nigerians lost their jobs in the pandemic. Now, Janet Cherry is Professor of Development Studies at um, University of uh, Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth, Gabeja. Her main areas of research are sustainable development, political economy, democratic participation, and social political history. She has published widely on labor, on women's and social movements, on transitional justice. Um, she recently published Spear of the Nation, on Conte We Sizwe, South Africa's Liberation Army, 1960 to 1990s. And of course, we also know her work from the Taking Democracy Seriously, Worker Expectations, and Parliamentary Democracy Project. Um, Janet, uh, although she probably won't highlight this, but I think it is important. 
was involved in the anti-apartheid underground. She was involved in NUSAS, the UDF, a wide range of projects, the trade unions. She was repeatedly jailed, uh, subject to death threats and so forth. Um, and come through all of it, a really wonderful human being. So Janet, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Janet will be talking on worker-controlled cooperatives and community-controlled renewable energy. And I'm gonna hand it over to her now. I'm just gonna pin her up and Janet, you've really got uh, 30, 40 minutes or so. And uh, yeah, um, just let's hope we got the sharing. And I'm just trying to work out how to pin you. Let me see if I worked it out. Oh, somebody's in the waiting room. Okay, more pin. Okay, Perhaps. Janet, there you go. You. you should be on the highlight. Yeah. Good Thanks, afternoon, Janet. everybody. Can you see me? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, we can. Good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon, Ilva. <laughs> so I just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that yesterday somebody was, was killed in a protest around electricity in Alexandra. And over the last couple of days, there have been a number of events which have just highlighted the, the current energy crisis in South Africa. So there were a couple of things that happened. In Soweto and Alexandra, there were uh, the, the situation where City Power, which is a semi-privatized service, uh, electricity service company, uh, was cutting down the illegal connections that residents had made. And at the same time, uh, the power had been cut to sections of, the, of, the, of Soweto and residents were demanding that there be a flat rate of 200 Rand a month, which was really interesting. Uh, so they were saying, we are paying for electricity, we are prepared to pay. I think you'll be aware from the days of the electricity, Soweto Electricity Crisis Committee that there was a long-standing boycott of pay for payment of electricity. But it's just to illustrate that this is really coming to a head in South Africa as a, as a, a crisis issue. And at the same time today, the 22nd, uh, the civil society campaign, which is called Uproot DMRE, <laughs> Has, has been taking place. And in a way, this seminar links in very nicely with that, because we're going to look a little bit at civil society and the relationship of civil society to the state in confronting these issues. So the DMRE, the Uproot DMRE campaign has a, a series of demands, and I'm just going to, to outline them quickly, just to see we can come back to them during the seminar. Demand one is that the leadership and structure of the DMRE must be transformed. Demand two is a rapid and just transition to a more socially owned renewable energy powered economy, providing clean, safe and affordable energy for all, with no worker and community left behind in the transition. Demand three is no to new polluting, corrupt and expensive coal, oil and gas projects, including the power car power ship program which has just been approved by the way, and a demand for 1 million climate jobs instead. And I'm gonna come back to that. And then demand four is communities must have the right to say no to mining projects. And demand five is that Gwede uh, uh, Mantashe must stop blocking and inhibiting ESCOM's transition to renewables. So it's an interesting set of demands. Um, and the Climate Justice Charter campaign, which is aligned with this African Climate Alliance, uh, also yesterday presented the Climate Justice Charter to Wits University. So it's in, it's in this context where there's uh, both what we can call informal and formal civil society protests around energy policy and uh, provision of, of electricity services that we are wanting to introduce you to the Saltuba Energy Cooperative, which is an example, as I've put in the abstract of both emancipatory scholarship in terms of how we did this as a research project and what we call prefigurative praxis. So we're trying to experiment with something which we see as possibly the, the way of the future, which is why it's an exciting thing. So although it has many problems, uh, it is an exciting thing to talk about. 
So just to, to introduce you and greet some of the people who are here, uh, who are involved with the project. Um, I don't know if Nkor Jikeka is here, if he's managed, from NUMSA, if he's managed to get online, but I think he will join us. Um, Siabolela Mama and Patrick Brennan, who are both part of the Amandla Collective, collective in Grebeche. Uh, I see Comrade Zanukola Wayile is here, who was uh, involved. He was actually the mayor of, of Nelson Mandela Bay at the time we started this project. Uh, and then Trevin van der Valt and Khaled El Jabi, who are both involved with the, the technical side of the, of the, the project. And then I also see there's some colleagues from Visma University who are involved in a joint action project with us, and they will be involved with this next year in well, from November. So let me just give you firstly the background to the project. I'm going to share my screen so I can show you some, some images of the project as well. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, there we go. So, I've just got to work out how to move it. Yeah, let me give you a bit of background to the project. So we started the project in the township of Kozakele five years ago, and the leadership actually came from Nkoji Keka, who is an activist from Kozakele. He's now a NUMSA organizer on the East Rand, but he was a student in the development studies department at the time. And as I said, oh, uh, Comrade Wayele was the mayor at that point as well <laughs> in the city. So the impetus came from Ankor, who said one of his objectives was to build a sustainable production cooperative, which is worker owned and controlled. Okay, so this was, this was coming from Ankor. Um, and this was linked into the idea of the transition to a more just and egalitarian economy. And at the time, I think uh, we were also looking at the the SACP slogan, which was uh, socialism is the future, build it now, and seeing how we could try and do that in practice. But from my side, the impetus came from the challenge of climate change and an eco-socialist response to, to climate change. So we, were talk we started talking about the just transition. And since COP17, which was in 2011, we established a Nelson Mandela Bay transition network, which was part of the global climate justice movement leading to COP17. And we sent a delegation there. Um, so Khaled, who is here, I think he was also part of that Nelson Mandela Bay transition network. So what happened was that in core, myself and other progressive activists established the Amandla Collective. And we started working in partnership with the ARDC in Cape Town on issues of climate change and the just transition. And since then, we've been involved with the Climate Justice Charter campaign and the Food Sovereignty campaign, uh, working together with COPAC at Fitz University. Uh, but you'll see here on the screen, the slogans from the Climate Justice Charter campaign, including my t-shirt with which, the, the, the slogan which I really like, which is the one which is cool it with people's power, which seems to bring together these different elements of of, of power in both senses of the word. And this was one of the most significant parts of the civil society forum at COP17. I remember this is 10 years ago and uh, the 1 million climate jobs campaign was launched there with Kasatu uh, Numsa being involved in it. And there were some German trade unionists there who talked about how the transition away from coal in Germany had resulted in the creation of tens or hundreds of thousands of new jobs through the retrofitting of buildings, factories, homes, etc. And uh, this was, at the time, was what we considered to be the viable uh, way forward. This was a uh, 
a, a booklet produced by AIDC, which we ran workshops on with activists in Kwazakele and other townships in, in Nelson Mandela Bay and around the country, I believe. But interesting, over the last 10 years, there's been a move away from the climate jobs position from labor and increasing fears of job losses in the context of mass unemployment, structural unemployment. So we have to explore this quite delicately. There's a, a huge debate going on in terms of what is this, a low carbon wage led sustainable path? Is there such a thing? What does this mean for labor? And I also wanted to refer to, again, 10 years ago, uh, SACP position, which was adopted about building working class power in our communities, which involved building the solidarity economy, creating cooperative banks, creating local people's committees for land, food and infrastructure, and combined with this a struggle against corruption. Now think about this. This was all happening 10 years ago. Hey? What progress have we made? Labor is on the defensive. There's no question about it with the, the huge economic crisis. The climate crisis is worse than ever and inequality is, is worse than ever. So as we know, South Africa is in a, a real uh, crisis of, of structural unemployment. So let's look at our context. This is, the, this is our premise in this project, that we have democratic space in South Africa, but we as the left, as labor, as progressive forces are not using that democratic space. We cannot find examples of viable, cooperatives, especially production cooperatives. We haven't seen workers or the unemployed taking over sites of deindustrialization, the unused infrastructure from the deindustrialization, which has occurred over the past decades in Nelson Mandela Bay and elsewhere. And our other premise is that working class townships have unutilized assets. So Kwazakele, which is where we are experimenting with this project, is full of empty factories, abandoned school buildings, open plots of land, and a big decommissioned coal-fired power station. So there's infrastructure there which can be repurposed for, for other purposes. Um, so this is the premise of our, of our model and our argument. It's that technology is a liberating force. So in, in Marxist terms, you can talk about advances in the forces of production, as Marx said, this is something which should be liberating for us. New technology, in particular renewable energy, and combined with, with digital technology, enables the decentralization and localization and socialization of production. At the same time, it enables us to respond to the climate catastrophe, which is impending. So I just want to refer you to Ras Maharaj. Some of you might have come across his work in this area. He says the technological capacities and capabilities of the new industrial revolution hold huge potential in redressing some of the negative conditions, but only if these are socially organized to deal with the material, psychosocial, cultural, and other impacts confronting Africa today. Africa has the advantage of not needing to replicate failed mega projects, which are resource intensive, corruption prone and ecologically disastrous. The quest for solutions to the problem of energy generation, for instance, could be democratically and socially organized towards the renewable forms of energy utilized closer to consumption, thereby obviating the losses in transmission and eliminating further carbon emissions. Okay, so I'm not gonna explain the technology if you're not familiar with this, but this is the essence of the, the argument about technology. How do we do this? Socialize and democratize production, energy production. So the premise that we are working on is that even within this global and national capitalist mode of production, that it is possible to change social relations of production and that we have the democratic space in South Africa to experiment with this process. So our project, what is it? It's to apply this theory and test this model in a working class township, which is Kwazakele. The project overall is called Transition Township. So it refers to two transitions. The one is the transition away from fossil fuel. Uh, and the other is 
the just transition to a more egalitarian economy, uh, which we, some people refer to as eco-socialism, but you don't need to give it an ideological label. Um, but essentially it involves a change in, in relations of both production and distribution. Um, and what is the model? The model is neighborhood cooperatives, what we're calling neighborhood cooperatives to produce energy, food and recycle waste in an integrated and sustainable system of production and distribution. The cooperatives are based around gap taps, which are public open spaces. Uh, and in a way, this is a reclaiming of the commons. These are bits of urban land, but they are, they are actually controlled generally by the residents, the people who live there. So it's using an existing social network. And the cooperatives should be producing their own inputs in terms of generating electricity, capturing water, using waste for production so that they are not dependent on the municipality for inputs. Um, obviously they, they need capital inputs in terms of infrastructure for renewable energy, for PV solar. But it's not aimed at uh, self-sufficiency, but to produce energy for local markets and sell electricity to the municipal grid. So this is, this is important to note because we're not here looking at a, a model of a, a, a sustainable village. So there are some rural projects which attempt to do sustainable villages, which are completely self-sufficient off-grid, etc. This is not premised on that. It's premised on feeding into the existing municipal grid selling food on existing markets and in fact, creating local markets. So, oh, sorry. Okay, so this gives you an idea of, of where we are. I'll show you, this is Kwasakele. Uh, 25,000 households, population of 120,000. Uh, as I explained, there, there are a lot of public buildings and uh, so on. There's also important to note is in Jolie Square, which is the center of the old townships in Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, and this, this center is in the process of being developed as a major hub including uh, trade, government offices. It's a transport hub already with all the taxi ranks here, et cetera. And it goes to, from all the, all the townships to town, to Motherwell and the Utenhag and so on as well. Uh, and then this is Struendale, which is the industrial area on this side. Uh, and this is also industrial, this is industrial. So it's surrounded by industrial area. And many of the, of the unemployed of the older generation are actually have skills through working in industry. Uh, it's a formal township. It's primarily got housing and services. It has electricity. So we're not looking at how we can provide electricity to the informal settlements, although that's another project. Uh, yeah, let me go back here. So this, this shows you the the first pilot of a, a little PV solar uh, carport structure that we erected in the gap tap. So the gap tap is a, is a public open space here between the houses. These are old houses, old uh, municipal houses built in the 1950s. And each gap tap is surrounded by 30 or so 35 houses. And the cooperative is set up with uh, in this case, the first one was set up, this is the Saltuba Cooperative, was set up with 25 houses, households, and each household has one representative on the, on the cooperative. Okay, how did we do this? Okay, so there was a, there was a process which has taken five years to, to get to this point. Uh, we called it a participatory action research process, but it involved the creation of a community research team of activists from Kwasakele who Mkoja Keka selected because he's an activist from that area 
and they then involved the community in mobilization through public meetings and they involved participatory research methods, resource mapping, conducting household surveys on food, water, electricity, consumption, expenditure, employment, household income, and then did a baseline study on rooftop PV solar. Uh, then we consulted with energy professionals uh, and with the municipality, municipal electricity department, which I've got to say was from the beginning, very supportive of this project and very interested in whether it could work. Um, and then of course we took it to the ward councillor, to the Nelson Mandela Bay Council. And uh, after a, quite a long process of consultation, we took a decision to experiment with this gap tap model. Um, and I'll show you, we are the gap taps. Yeah, so this gives you an idea. There are 120 gap taps in amongst all the houses. These red blocks show you the sites of the gap taps. And this here is the decommissioned power station. Uh, and we're looking at this, how this could possibly be refurbished, but okay, I won't go, I won't go into that now. But it just gives you an idea of, of, of where, where these gap taps are and how we can try and use them. Okay, so with our community research team, they then formed a, a development agency called Kwasakele Development Agency. Uh, they got training in research and computer skills. Uh, we had workshops on cooperatives with people who had established cooperatives before, visited various agricultural projects, waste recycling projects, uh, renewable energy projects and then identified a gap tap, which would be close to Njoli Square. And they then mobilized the residents of that gap tap, uh, formed and the residents then formed and registered the Saltuba Energy and All Purpose Cooperative. Um, yeah, and they elected their own officials, opened a bank account, et cetera. So the KDA then together with the Saltuba members engaged in a participatory design process. And they looked at energy, at food and at waste and decided what would go onto that gap tap and where. Uh, you know, they had to take into account what residents wanted to do with that space, uh, access issues, who would run it, etc. We offered some training in permaculture and they implemented experimental backyard gardens while we were waiting for some finalization of the PV solar system. Um, and to do that, we established a water capture system for rainwater and grey water, water tanks, and PV solar powered pumps for irrigation, uh, dams for water storage. We can, uh, Trevin can talk more about this if you want. And we established two food tunnels and we've got plans for aquaponics um, and expansion of, of vegetable production. But what's important for this seminar is the PV solar array, uh, which is a five megawatt system. It's very small at the moment, but what we've tested is that we can actually feed electricity into the municipal grid. Um, and our, our big problem is having a, an agreement with the municipality on how the Saltuba cooperative can be paid for that electricity. We'll come back to that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, when we're looking at how the co-op functions, we're looking at a core group of committed members of the co-op who live there. They maintain the gardens, they look after the PV solar array. Um, the produce of the gardens is used by the members or sold or distributed as they want. They decide on that. Uh, they are not paid for their labor, but they keep the revenue from the produce at the moment and decide how that revenue is divided. Um, but when we have installation of infrastructure like food tunnels and the PV solar array, uh, labor is paid at a rate agreed on by the Saltuba Co-op members in advance budgeted for and paid to the whoever is involved with the, the, the establishment of the infrastructure, like Energy Works and Urban Gardens, they're both represented here. So you can ask them more about that. Um, yeah, the, the 
the members of the co-op who live there look after the PV solar array. And that was going fine for 18 months until last month when in fact four panels were stolen. And this has been a big issue. We've been, every time we, we talk about this project, we get asked about aren't the PV solar panels going to be stolen. And interesting, you know, the, the, the market for PV solar has now really taken off mm. and they have become something that is, is uh, desirable for to be stolen. Okay, so let's look at the issue of labor. Uh, as you know, unemployment is very high in Rebecca. Kozakele has a, a, at least 50% unemployment of the economically active population. And it's it, this is structural unemployment in an industrial city, which is based on the motor industry. There's no mining, obviously, in, in Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, there's a huge concern about job losses in renewable energy, but not in Nelson Mandela Bay, because it, it's not uh, premised on coal mining. Um, our model is premised on worker ownership and control of the means of energy production rather than creation of employment or creation of jobs. Okay, so the idea is that the workers own the means of production rather than be employed by a company that owns or somebody else who owns it. Okay. Uh, the, the solar installation, just think about PV solar, once it's installed, it doesn't require a lot of labor to maintain it. I mean, electricity is, you know, it's captured by the sun and goes into the, into the municipal grid. So the main benefit for the members is, uh, is household income. It's not employment, it's household income. However, if this is rolled out in a big municipality, so we are looking at 110 gap taps, 110 of these local cooperatives, a substantial amount of jobs will be created in erecting and maintaining the PV solar systems. Um, secondly, I mean, take, I mean, use your imagination or your vision. If production of inputs is localized, things like PV solar panels, frames, electrical systems, etc., and manufactured in the local factories in South Africa as part of this industrial strategy for the transition, then of course there would be many jobs in manufacturing created as well. And we are arguing that Kwasakele together with Struendale and this old decommissioned power station could actually become the base for a new and sustainable form of industrial production in South Africa. And we are even looking at how we could use recycled plastic using extruders and 3D printers to make inputs into the production process like gutters and water tanks for food production. Yeah, we haven't quite got there yet. So the next part of the discussion is about the, the state and, and what is the relationship of this project to the state. And of course, we're talking mainly here about the local state and the Nelson Mandela Bay municipality. Um, our assumption, of course, is, is that we are not concerned with seizing, seizing state power. We're concerned with using the space that the democratic space that the democratic state allows us. And one of the key questions we've been grappling with is the relationship of this project to the local state. Uh, the, the model is premised on cooperation with the municipality. And of course, we're struggling with this in part because of political issues, instability in the metro, uh, uh, systems of patronage at ward level, four different mayoral committees since the project started with oh, Comrade Wayile. Uh, we've had four different mayoral committees, which we presented the project to, and everybody likes it. Everybody agrees in principle that it's a good idea, but it's, it does make it quite difficult. That there's no continuity in the municipality. But the relationship takes different forms. So on the one hand, it's a use of public land, municipal land. So these gap taps are municipally owned land. Uh, we have to negotiate the use of them. And that has been well, to date, it's been successful. We haven't had a problem with that. Um, secondly, it's use of public infrastructure, the municipal electricity grid. And as I said, we've had good support from municipal electricity department. Um, thirdly, it's next 
to Anjoli Square, which is part of a big municipal development plan. So we need to relate to that. Um, fourthly, we relate to the Economic Development Directorate in terms of urban agriculture and the support for, for production of, of, of fresh food, vegetables and possibly fish. Um, and then the, the big issue, of course, is, 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 is money, is payment for services and whether the project is producing more than it, consume, than it consumes. So if we are draining municipal water and uh, electricity in running the project, we will not get support from them. But as long as we are producing electricity and capturing water uh, and using gray water from people's houses, then we are, they are happy with it. We have had some contestation with local councillors and local stakeholders, but I won't go into that. I mean, it seems to be working out. Okay, so let me quickly... Uh, we can we can come back to to this uh, to to the the technical aspects of it in terms of what is possible, but we have done some some research and Patrick can can speak to this in terms of how we could really uh, roll this out to scale and enable township household owned production. Uh, and if you look from Saltuba Co-op and the numbers that we're talking about here, um, and you can take it up to ward level, this is Ward 22, up to the whole of Kwasakele Township with 25,000 households, uh, right up to the whole of South Africa, <laughs> and look at uh, how much revenue could be generated. But I won't go into too much of the, the business model here. I think we can come back to that in, in discussion. And, um, can, and Patrick can, can talk to it as well. But we essentially, we're looking at neighborhood production systems and a form of, of city energy exchange, which would enable households to benefit financially in terms of income, substantial income from this. So here, uh, you'll see what is said here is that the additional income is received as a dividend based on household ownership of a share in the cooperative and not in wages for employment, although there will be some labor required for supply, construction, operation, and maintenance of the installation. So that's uh, important to note. Okay, we, we are quite convinced that, I mean, you know, people seem to be skeptical about whether PV solar is actually able to provide the energy needs for South Africa and our current government is really committed to big projects. So if it's not coal-fired power stations, which are not functioning optimally, which cost a huge amount of money, like Modupi and Kosile, they are committed to nuclear power or car power ships as short-term solutions, gas pipelines, etc. We are quite convinced that if this was rolled out in a way that was uh, linked into municipal grids that it could provide for, uh, in fact, uh, more energy than, than is required at the moment. I mean, we 124% of current installed capacity. Okay, so let me just see, okay, let me uh, just talk very briefly about how we understand this in the relationship to the state and i you know i was very i was very taken with the lucian and kirk hillicker's little booklet on modes of politics at a distance from the state which explored how uh, how we relate to the state and it takes me back to the beginning of the seminar. We always talking a bit about civil society, trying to put pressure on the state to change its policies and so on. Um, so, so where we're coming from is not the, the mode of politics, which is outside and against the state, uh, which doesn't see any possibility of radical transformation coming from the state. 
clearly we are working uh, to some extent together with the state. The, the second model is what they call outside and despite the state. And this is really what we could talk about. I think they refer to experimental communism or prefigurative action, uh, which is autonomous and which leaves the state alone and which sometimes they term working in the cracks. You know, like uh, we can build alternatives in the cracks of the system. And when there are enough cracks that are wide enough, the system will start to crumble from within. Uh, the third model is outside, but with the state. And this is really what, what we are doing. Um, I mean, it's compatible with other examples we can look at, like uh, Kerala in you know, the communist government in, in India, uh, which allows some local autonomy while allowing the state to provide support in certain respects. Um, and in this model, the private sector continues to exist in parallel with the socialized sector and the state regulates both. So this is a truly mixed economy and it assumes, as Lucien argues, that the state can be delinked from capitalism, either to remove it or place it under some sort of regulation that does benefit the popular classes, if you like. Okay, so <clears throat> I just want to refer you to one last thing, which is um, an article by Jeremy Cronin, who said, he's talking about EPWP, about the Ex Expanded Public Works Program. And he said, civil society uh, is in South Africa, usually organizing either against the state or despite the, well, he didn't say this, I'm saying this in despite the state, but he says what happens is that more frequently people uh, are making demands of the state as what he terms righteous beneficiaries, okay? So this is popular, what he says, popular forces tend not to be mobilized as protagonists, as productive agents in building a new society. Rather, they are mobilized as righteous beneficiaries of state delivery. And the challenge is how to build state community mobilization in which there is a co-production of a new society. Okay, so in a way, what we're saying is that this is what we're trying to do. It's a co-production of, of a new society. Um, yeah, so uh, the, I can, I've, I've got some more conclusions, but I think I must leave it at this point and we'll have some discussion. I don't want to go on for too long. Um, yeah, Janet, that was was really excellent. Um, I, I know you mentioned uh, a couple of your uh, partners, I'd say, rather than collaborators um, might, might have arrived. If, as you're a co-host, um, I think if there's one or two of them you want to draw on for a bit, we could do yeah, that. Yeah, I, I see Nko is here, Nko um, Sinati Chikeka, and Patrick Brennan is here. I think you mentioned um, Trevin van der Valt. Is he also? Trevin van der Valt is involved with the food gardening. Khaled is El Jabi is here as well. I think. Um, yeah. Do Do any of any of you want to be, before we open up for general questions? Um, any Anybody want to come in there? Of those uh, just named by Janet. Uh, uh, hi, Jeanette. I, I'm sorry, man. I, I just joined. I, I had a connectivity problem, so I miss a whole lot of uh, what has been discussed. Maybe I can just join you in terms of responding to questions. Gosnati, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Nkho. And Gosnati, do, do you want to take the, the floor, so to speak, for a bit? So, uh, Lucien, of course, says he, he will rather respond to questions. He doesn't want to. Oh, oh, oh no, no he problem. just joined. He just managed to join. Oh, OK. Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Um, uh, I'm happy to Patrick. make some comments about the, the model and also that, okay. um, that the um, projections for, for the production. Janet, if you could put those slides back up. And, is it possible? 
Yeah, I'll do that. Which one do you want? So the, that one there. So um, look at the bottom of that slide, the Saltuba Carp, 25 households, our projection in the original um, uh, feasibility study, we said we want a hundred um, kilowatt system, and that will produce around about 150,000 kilowatt hours per annum, which at the current rate of what people are paying for electricity in, in Port Elizabeth is around about uh, about 285,000. Um, projecting those up those figures upwards uh, ward 22 was uh, was uh, to do the, exactly the same thing e each household by the way getting a four kilowatt um, uh, system in part of a four kilowatt system the actual one that we we had up there was five kilowatts uh, the production there would be 22 million ward 22 which is where the salt the carpet is located because the as a whole it's 150 million uh, kilowatt hours per annum, which is you know, close to 300 million uh, rands value. And again, it goes all the way up to the, to the city and then the province and the, and, and the country. But I mean, if we were to, because what, what effectively that means is that Kwasakele gets an extra 300 million, 285 million rand circulating in it per annum. And bearing in mind that the current Sort of income into that to the township is around about seven eight hundred million rand uh, because the average household income is around about one. We're not sure if it's as low as one one eight one thousand eight hundred a month. It, we think it's a little bit of an undercount, but you know, let's say it's two two and a half thousand rand a month. We'd be adding a thousand rand to that per household, and you know, they said the impact of that on the township would be you know profound. To grow the economy of the township by 30 percent so that's the one side of this now obviously we're not saying that all 16 million households should participate but it's not that difficult for each household in the country to put up a five kilowatt system on its roof it's not and it's not not beyond the realms of possibility and even if you did 10 percent of them that would more or less plug the gap of that they'd be currently experiencing with the load shedding so just to, to bear in mind that the at scale, these numbers really make sense. That's the one issue. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about that as well. And Janet, you could just put up the, the business model slide, the renewable energy. This one. That one. This one. Yeah. So what we're saying is that, it, so that if you think about it in terms of you know, supplies, suppliers are going to be supplying labor and um, uh, sort of means of production and machinery business services in some kind of mercantile exchange you can you, you can register for the quasi care transition township mercantile exchange that gives you the ability to su supply our neighborhood production system with all those um, you know those various different things so the solar PV the wind turbines biodigesters um, Business services and labor as well. Okay, so people would be able to register on the township exchange, and be, if you've got skills in solar installation, you'll be a, we'll find out when the, where someone's installing panels, and that 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 would be communicated to people, and they'd be able to participate through that. Uh, and we not we haven't designed this yet, but the idea would be some kind of online, and maybe even have a location where people can. Um, can meet and then it's each household with four kilowatt um, uh, system for, for the whole of Kwasakele that's 100 megawatts which is the limit of the new limit of the um, uh, NERSA regulations that was recently uh, uh, announced and then you can see it would produce for Kwasakele, 150, gig, 150 gigawatts per, per gigawatt hours per annum, and that can be sold into the grid and to... So that's the basic model. And that can be applied to any neighborhood production system. So it's not just 
energy, you know, food production, and we've done some work on this as well, waste uh, recycling, etc. But the idea is that you're providing, you're creating markets, providing services to build the local economy in these various different areas, specifically towards the decentralization of production systems. And you know, it can be done in various different ways. Uh, you know, this energy is the easiest to conceptualize because it's, it's once you put the thing up, it produces energy for the next 25 years. And all you've got to do is keep it clean and make sure people don't throw stones at it that kind of thing, and that they don't steal it, et cetera. So I think I can leave it there, the question. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks. Um, Listen, do you see Babalwa Lobisha has Yes, yes, I've about. just seen her a note. I I've, I've, would like to, Babalwa, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. We can't Hi. hear you. You're a bit quiet, Babalwa. Hello? We can't hear you. Can you take it up a bit? Can you hear me now? A mm. little bit, a little bit. Give it a go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm Baba Lualo Biche, uh, one of the residents of the North Mande and the political activist around the area. I, I applaud the initiative and uh, it's going to assist um, our city towards uh, one of the, the six, uh, uh, resolution on energy. Planet. But my 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 question to Janet uh, is that have they considered the fact that uh, each and every piece of land is now invaded? What then will become their mitigation plan if? by the time they go to the municipality and the land is uh, occupied on the sites that they have, the 120, they have identified. If they then move to the old uh, um, power station, will the supply uh, render or anywhere else within it? Because if it's invaded, they will be forced to, to move the project elsewhere. Have they considered that and also the impact then of uh, the project, but I must say it's quite a an interesting one, which uh, I see it. Uh, I see the city going uh, adopting it because the need is there. It's just that uh, we we need to to be stable and we need stability at the municipality so that uh, such initiatives can be taken forward and assist the, uh, the residents going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Babalua. Um, are, there, are there any other questions? Um, just throw up your hand. I should be able to see it. Um, okay, wh while you're thinking, let, let me just throw one or two to Janet. Uh, Janet, uh, this seems really very encouraging. Uh, usually, people are critical of cooperatives, um, and I'm thinking of, say, Kate Phillips' work, saying that the one problem with setting up worker cooperatives is that there are often markets on the margins. Um, and Klunkler, I've, I've noted you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the platform in a sec. Um, the, often the problem is you setting up cooperatives in super uh, marginal areas, and that makes it very hard for co-ops to sustain themselves. Um, they don't have access to markets, they're operating in areas of high unemployment, low wages, and they're also competing against large entrenched branded uh, corporations. So this seems to be a partial solution. Secondly, it, uh, in that this is a, a good that people want Secondly, that you're locating it in community. So it's not like you have a co-op in a community, but community uh, members actually have shares in the co-op. So th this seems to me to, to actually be quite an important breakthrough. Um, my question is this, um, how, how do, are you going to try to address the issue of sustaining democratic organizations around co-ops? Because this issue of, of what some have called degeneration seems to be uh, a recurrent one that over time cooperatives tend to emulate more and more the hierarchical management systems of uh, capitalism and the state. 
So I was wondering about the sustainability issue. The second question goes to the question of protecting the commons. To the extent that this is, is based on um, what are effectively commons in the township, and it's also based on a sort of a social commons in the sense that people are trusting one another, are treating this as common property and respecting it. How will you deal with um, problems, for example, vandalism, which, which do affect many public services, uh, whether it's schools during the lockdown, cable theft, uh, people vandalizing train stations. So those are the two questions. Uh, and Clan Claire, do you want to just uh, raise your question? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, Prof. Uh, to everybody and uh, and and Janet, thank you. Uh, such a uh, um, uh, an informative, uh, interesting case study you've got. I I was going to ask about. Uh, um, I think it was uh, Brennan uh, who responded to um, who sort of like. Uh, uh, made further inputs on the estimates of uh, indirect incomes stemming from the project. Um, and linked to that, I was going to ask if you've had um, any uh, thoughts, ideas about estimates around the number of jobs um, and the types of jobs um, that could come out of uh, this particular project, but also maybe other similar green, green uh, projects. Uh, mainly because, uh, you know, this is probably the main persuading point uh, politically and economically. So uh, that was going to be uh, uh, one of my questions, and I think part of it has been answered. Um, and now uh, Lucian is talking about um, uh, uh, something that also crossed my mind around how do you get, um, how do you get a buy-in locally? Uh, for collective accountability to present uh, to prevent, for example, issues of uh, vandalism. We have a project somewhere in Matatia and surrounding villages where we're trying to get such estimates, you know, to, but for us really it's around pers uh, to, to try and persuade uh, uh, the buy-in from policy making and uh, local, local communities to take on to our projects, but we're dealing mainly with environmental water and land resources. Um, yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are around, around these uh, topics. Um, Janet, uh, do, you, do you want to take these questions or do you want to take one or two more? Um, I see there's a hand from Sakile and I see Wayne Fortain has also put a question in the, in the comments. Do you want to address these questions and hold yeah, on to Sakile or do you want to pick up Wayne and Sakile as well? No, I should just mention uh, Prof. Nklant uh, Nambat, who just spoke, is the uh, director of the Institute of Social and Economic Research at, at Rhodes, who took up his post um, about a year and a bit back. So very welcome. Right, thank you. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me go for these ones first. Okay. So first, Babalwa's questions about, about the whether there's occupation of the gap taps, if I understood you correctly. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting issue because this is public open space. And at, to date in Kwasakili, uh, those gap taps have, have been, have not been occupied by residents who, or people coming in and putting up other structures on them. Um, it's not to say that this won't ever happen, um, but the, the idea and the way in the, the municipality has been running it is that the, the residents of the houses around that gap tap have some say over what happens on that gap tap. So they sort of informally manage it. And they do use it sometimes for other purposes. I mean, particular for things like funerals or occasions where they put up tents or park cars there and so on. Uh, but this is a temporary measure. And then on some gap taps, the municipality has had projects where they put up um, sports uh, equipment or play equipment, like playing, what do you call those things? Play park equipment or baseball nets and this kind of thing. But basketball, basketball nets. Uh, so, so that is an option. But we, you see, we're not saying that we would, con we or not we, but the the Kwasakele cooperatives would control every gap tap or every piece of open land. 
I mean, the residents in each case must decide whether they want to run a primary co-op on that space. The, the second thing is that there are actually other, there are other options. So we looked at not using the gap tap space, but using rooftop PV solar on every household. And we also did an estimate on if we used certain buildings, including the schools, many of which in Kwasakele are unused. I mean, there are, you won't believe the number of large derelict buildings or unutilized buildings which are standing around, which could actually be used. I mean, the big rooftops used for PV solar and for water capture. So yeah, there may be alternatives in some cases to using the, the actual gap tap. But it's a model. We don't, we're like experimenting with the model. We haven't got anywhere near implementing it yet. Um, the, the old power station is also interesting because it actually is a piece of infrastructure which was sold by the municipality to a private businessman. And it's now being leased to Transnet or Spurnet, I think, Transnet, to store manganese which is brought down from the northern cape and then shipped out through the harbor so the idea is that manganese will be stored at the port of Nucha, which is designed for dirty storage things so so hopefully that that facility will be will be freed up and i don't know i mean we we're dreaming maybe that the municipality will buy it back and have it converted into something else but you know one can always dream about these things we don't seem to have much lobbying power at the moment around big infrastructure but you know maybe we'll get there um in terms of the the critique of co-ops i mean the the, whole, the point about the electricity co-op is that uh it has a captive market and what we're playing on is the is the Two things. The one is the change in legislation that allows municipalities to, to procure electricity from independent power producers. And the other is that this municipality has actually experimented in the past with a form of a feed-in tariff where it's allowed what are usually middle-class households to put up solar panels and then effectively reverse our service charges so we can reduce our municipal bill through feeding electricity into the municipality rather than taking it from them. Um, now, our, our logic is that why should it be the, the wealthy households that can afford to put up PV solar who benefit from this policy? I mean, every single household should be able to benefit if we can provide the capital outlay to buy solar power, solar panels, PV panels. So that is that is part of the, the business model. Um, the, the food market is premised on this idea that we shouldn't be buying food in, which is can be grown locally, but really locally, and then sold through a network, a cooperative distribution network. So, I mean, that we've calculated how much people spend on vegetables and it's a lot, you know, people are buying vegetables, but the vegetables may be grown in Limpopo and shipped down, the carbon cost is great, the storage cost, the refrigeration cost, et cetera. Anyway, so it's part of that whole discussion. Um, in terms of co-ops being hierarchical, uh, yeah, look, it's, it's really difficult. And this is very experimental at this stage, but the, the premise of the gap tap co-op is that it's household based. So all you have to do is be a home, well, you know, the Kwasakele houses are old municipal houses which were transferred into people's ownership. So they are, you have to be a resident there in Kwasakele of that gap tap. And you then have an equal share in the co-op. And then the residents can elect a committee. The committee can change over time, as has happened already. We've had two different committees elected um, because people come and go and so on. But the point is it's only the people, only the households there who have a vote in that gap tap. Who does the work, who runs it, etc., that doesn't matter. The, the benefit is to the members of that co-op equally. 
the people who are running additional things like selling vegetables or whatever, they can decide. I mean, they can they can make a decision about how they want to distribute the income from the vegetables or how they want to sell the vegetables and so on. But the electricity, the model is that each household benefits equally from the infrastructure. We don't know if this will survive. I mean, if it will last as a model. I mean, and I think like any organization, there are some people who are very committed to it. You know, like there's a sort of core of about, there's a core of sort of four, four residents who are really committed to this. And then there's a slightly bigger group of about 10 who participate in decision-making and so on. But the, it's, it's the membership that's important that each household is, has a, a registered member of the co-op. Um, the protecting the commons, again, as I said, the, the public open space, the, the gap taps, the residents must decide what they want to do with that, that land. If they don't want to have an energy co-op, if they want to, if they don't like the idea of vegetable farming, if they want, rather want to run a restaurant or not do anything and keep it open as a car park, well, you know, it's their prerogative to do that. So it has to be premised on, an, on the neighborhood in that particular locality. And the idea, of course, is that a whole lot of these neighborhood co-ops will then link up into a, a secondary co-op for whatever it is, like marketing of vegetables or selling energy or providing services to the co-ops, et cetera. But it starts with that neighborhood, neighborhood co-op. Um, and then, yeah, and Chancellor's question, I think I'll ask Patrick to respond to that in terms of the, the number and the type of, of jobs that can be created through, through the co-ops. Pat, do you want to respond to that one? Yeah, so we haven't, we haven't made projections on a, a job creation. And kind of the re so I mean it's still possible to to do you know, that kind of those kind of estimates we just haven't done them but the 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 model is based on it's almost like a body a cross between a body corporate running a a, a building or a, um, a block of flats let's say and a street committee and the idea is that the the purpose of the cop is to manage the asset. Um, that belongs to the surrounding households, and um, it's kind of an uh, the one of the reasons we chose this particular um, uh, the, the, the gap tap. It's, the, the idea of a gap tap was that they gap taps were a, part, a form of apartheid infrastructure, in the sense that each of those households. The reason why it's called a gap tap is that they didn't have running water, so they would come there to fetch water until. I'm not sure exactly when water was provided, but I think it might have been even after '94. The point being is that it's it's a it's a it's a public open space that belongs to everybody that should be an asset or could be an asset, and our idea is to teach the cooperative how to manage the asset, how to what what you know how to look after it for 25 years, and even if if nobody works on it, if they like, let's say on renewable energy, even if there's only one job created, each household will nevertheless benefit um, from the management of that asset. Because what we are kind of saying, the, the numbers you're looking at, they include food production as well. But we're saying just with the energy, you know, it's going to be at least a thousand rand a month per household that, that can be distributed. Um, which again, it's significant in an area where the, the average household income is around about to two and a half thousand rand per month. Um, one would have, I suppose there were, one would have to look at uh, doing some estimates of what the multiply effect of, of uh, extra thousand uh, rand per month per household in that area would be on the job base of the area. And another exercise that could be done would be to estimate how much how many jobs would be created if you were to produce all of the solar panels uh, somewhere locally, let's say like at the old power station, if it was repurposed or if, uh, one of the other brownfield sites that are there could be repurposed. You know, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, 
and um, we we anticipate that it would be it would be significant. Um, but our focus has been on uh, you know getting people to, to have an asset and to, to manage that asset. And it's one of the reasons why we're saying, you know, if robots can do stuff, as long as the ro the community owns the robots, that's fine. Um, and if, if we need to use technology to increase the production of something, we should be doing that because it's the it's the product that actually matters in this, in this particular model. That the surplus gets distributed to each household, uh, and and we're saying households, not owners. So. You have to actually live in that house to be a member of the cooperative. Mm. You, can't be, you can't own the house and come from outside. Um, the other idea is that it's extreme democracy, and that, that as the, as the transition township, we take people through a process where they you know, we reinforce. In this area, is not difficult. But we reinforce democratic traditions and democratic democratic decision making. Um, and provide people with the tools and support they need to be able to to deepen that over time. Um, Thanks, Patrick. I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, are, are there other questions or follow up questions? Comrades on a Klolo, you got the floor. And then uh, comrades <laughs> Killer. And that reminds me, we must just also look at Wayne. I don't know if Wayne, you want to just say your question rather than uh, we look at it in the com box. It's it's up to you. But let's go in this order, Zonaklolo, Sakile, and then uh, Wayne, if you if you want to us uh, to read it, that's cool. Otherwise I'll look for your hand. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon to all the participants and thanks very much, Prof, uh, for for the seminar. And thanks for the presentation uh, <clears throat> because it's quite inspiring because uh, if you look around the country, there's a state of political despair um, across different constituencies, whether you talk about the labor constituency, um, ordinary people, so there's despondency. And um, at times there's a lack uh, of uh, courage to take some initiatives. Uh, and, and that's why we'll have to appreciate the initiative of, of this nature. But also I do agree with the presenter that there's a serious problem with the civil society, including the trade union movement. Um, um, in terms of um, uh, we no longer uh, being um, the catalyst, um, uh, whether you talk of social development campaigns and everything. But it's a debate for another day. Uh, but there are a few issues which I just want to highlight. Um, one is when you talk about the cooperative, uh, there's a kind of a stigma uh, about cooperatives uh, in South Africa that is not a viable option. Um, uh, and what is it that is being done in terms of um, dealing with the mindset? Because there ought to be a paradigm shift in terms of the mindset uh, of the community. Uh, in ensure, in the context of ensuring that there's a sustainability of that particular initiative, that's part one. The second thing is uh, around the technology. Um, I hear presenters referring to technology, but when you talk about technology, some of the technology is not South African made, and it's, uh, it's from overseas. And I know even from the manufacturing industry, if there's gonna be technological changes or automation, the, some of those would be regulated into main agreements 
because the cost of the technology, the maintenance um, of that uh, technology in terms of skills and expertise becomes uh, one of the important issues as well. And how do we find our ways uh, in terms of getting the right technology and where do we source some of those particular resources, uh, uh, financial resources in terms of sourcing that technology. I think the last issue, the, the prop, there's a lot of funds um, within the provincial governments. At times, um, you would see that when there's a end of financial year, there are a lot of funds that go back to the national treasury because they are not um, utilized. I think that's a, a universal phenomenon in a number of provinces, including the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. Then there would be a, like ITP, the integrated um, the, the IDP processes allow different communities and councillors to ensure that some of the community projects find expression, um, whether in terms of the what based budgeting processes. Um, to what an extent is that opportunity being explored? And the last prof is an issue of the CITAS. Probably we can pursue a discussion outside this particular forum. Um, well, there are a lot of opportunities in terms of the CITAS funding different initiatives, including the energy and water CITA. It does have some funds that are allocated for the project of this nature. And if you go to Mesita, you would find that there's what is called retrenchment assistant program, which allocates funds for the retrenches um, because of the problems of deindustrialization. But these are some of the issues that I think we can discuss outside and also explore the possibilities of partnership. Um, Probably myself and Go, uh, we can be members of the co-op in diaspora because we are in Johannesburg. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Com. Um, I I've noted uh, Sakile, Marcus, uh, Mike Untetela, Luca, and Christopher. Um, Wayne has has just rephrased his his talk uh, his question, so I'm going to read it out quick. He says, with the latest car power ship, um, the licensing process underway or in progress, how will it benefit local residents? What impact will it have? So it's about the car power ship um, uh, licensing. Okay, um, I'm going to take people in the order that I noted them. Sakile is now. Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just start by saying thank you for the presentation, Janet. It was really uh, fantastic. And also, uh, yeah, big, big uh, applause for Ngosnati and Patrick and yourself, of course. I know how hard you worked uh, from the sessions on Mission Vale campus uh, and Kettle Wars to where you are now. It's really, it's really been an incredible journey. Um, just in terms, and I, I, I just want to pick up from something prop Prof. Ntlantla said, and I think Patrick has tried to answer this somewhat, but in terms of the model, financially, the Gap, Gap Tap Co-op will supplement the income to households within Kwazakele, which is great because, as Patrick mentioned, it's additional income into the township economy. But in terms of job creation, I think you mentioned the idea of local, local companies, uh, local industries, uh, then manufacturing and installing, uh, in this case, the solar panels. And I was just an idea. I hope that's my correct understanding. So the, the gap type co-op, you know, generates income, but doesn't necessarily create jobs. And if that's the case, um, I was 
kind of thinking along the times as along the same lines as uh, the previous speaker, uh, Mr. Waile, in thinking that perhaps an idea could be to possibly engage the CETA. And I wasn't thinking, I was thinking about more targeting the unemployed youth and perhaps engaging the skill CETA and they could potentially give uh, some kind of incentive or funding to companies that train and hire unemployed youth uh, to install the PVC uh, solar panels. Um, but yeah, that's it for my side. Thanks, Sakile. Um, uh, Marcus and then Mike. Hi, Marcus, are you still here? Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I'm sorry, Lucien. No, far away. I'm in Cape Town. Sorry, I didn't get the question. No, fire away. Oh. Go for it. Okay, fine, thanks. Firstly, I want to just say thank you for a very interesting input, Janet. And of course, the participation and points raised are very interesting. I'm Marcus Solomon. I'm from the Children's Resource Center in Cape Town. We've been around for about 40 years, and our main mission has been to build a movement of children. And I won't be longer because I just want to slot in on the issue of energy production uh, in the context of climate change and global warming. Um, what Janet refers to, what uh, Jeremy spoke about, co-production of a new society. Now, if you look at, was a careless for example, whatever number of people you have, the half of those are children. And over the last seven or eight years, we've been producing what we call the wonder bag. These are used by children, the child members of the movement. And the, the important thing we emphasize is the agency children have. Now we also have for many years, in fact, we're a national project movement. We've had a president Port Elizabeth is London, Grahamstown, Bathurst for many years, although some of them have sort of uh, died down. But in Port Elizabeth, we've got, got three of, if, even in Kwasa Kerala, the comrade there is Felicia, Leticia. And the first group we started was in, in modern times, when I say that it's the last 10, 15 years, was it in Rimfasma, near Bishop, uh, near, uh, 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 Battle's Dog. We have a group in Kwasa Kele. And uh, the point I just really want to ask or make, and then also maybe ask how do we see children fitting into this issue of cooperatives, but more importantly, in producing alternative energy? Now, the Wonder Bag is not for job creation, except maybe in the home but it's really to use the skills in the home. And we've trained children to make the wonder bags, but also to understand eventually th through their own development and growth, how this can begin to save energy and make some contribution. It's not so much to save the planet so much, but to begin to develop understanding what needs to be done to develop alternative energy. And I think, uh, and I'll, I'll stop there, except just to also say on the issue of cooperatives. Well, people have had many years of working on Stockfeld and Hoi Hoi. Now, I think there's something wrong. It's not really what is a problem with communities. I think it's the environment that for many years, and also in the trade union movement, especially in Port Elizabeth, been many attempts I think it's more the power of the capital system, the capital's value. And I think we need to continue to grapple with that. Uh, but my main point here is just to raise the issue of wonder bags, not to pr produce by child, child children and communities to save energy in the home. It's also a very safe method of, of cooking because initially it was developed in Cape Town as a, as a safety measure when there were so many fires. Uh, yeah, but let me stop there. And I just think it's very interesting. And I, I think that uh, we'll certainly, uh, Felicia has been asked to make contact with the group with which we, uh, in Port Elizabeth, with which we are familiar, 
But I think we'll come back to that because I think it's a very uh, creative and exciting idea. Thanks. Thanks, Marcus. Um, next up, I've got uh, Mike to tell her. Comrade Mike. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I wish to thank uh, Janet for the presentation. And I can see it's a presentation that is quite loaded, you know, because there's a whole lot of history behind it, you know, and there's been a whole lot of work, you know, that has gone into it. Uh, well, as, as one of the residents who grew up near the Bozakel um, coal uh, police station, we learned a lot, but uh, few a few years later, we joined the labor movement, some of us. We became part of the Health Before Profits campaign. And the, descent, uh, the, the, the WHO and ILO uh, descent health campaign, I mean, descent health campaign and the workers' rights are human rights too. You know, there were those kinds of campaigns by the Global Union Federations. Mm -hmm. And linked to that is the reality that the cap taps were there. We never really cared what they were formed for, you know, because we were growing up, we we're young, we didn't have time for that. All we knew was that we'd go there and get some water. You know, that was what we, we knew at the time. Uh, when I joined VETS in 2011, I got interested in pursuing the issue of cooperatives because I was interested in understanding why certain federations like COSATO, for instance, would not have a particular or a clear, a shouting, so to speak, a shouting resolution on the support uh, for, for cooperatives. Because for me, I thought that was, you know, something that was worthy of the, 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 the labor movement support. It sounded more socialist to me. When I joined now, I managed to get uh, to the nitty gritties of SACO. You know, there is that workers cooperative in Nihau, but the workers themselves and the staff members themselves are not really aware of what SACO is doing. So I stayed there for two, three years up until I got to VETS and I attempted to write a proposal on the establishment, comma, sub, uh, establishment uh, progress and support for cooperatives. I think that was my title. Mm -hmm. I couldn't finish that. You know, I continue to have a lot of questions with regards to some skepticism, uh, particularly in government policy circles as to why is it difficult for the policy, uh, you know, uh, the policy people to actually make sure that support, uh, that, that support for cooperatives is achieved. Because, um, you know, if you do have a national cooperative strategy and you also have provincial cooperative strategies, why would you find it difficult as both national and, and provincial governments to support that which you, you've resolved on, e.g. the cooperative strategies that both the national government and the provincial government uh, are, have, are having? So I, 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 you know, when I saw this, I started to think about revisiting the ideological questions as to why there is such a skepticism, even though we are part of BRICS and we have India, we've got Brazil, where we can learn or where we have actually learned, you know, a lot of lessons, uh, you know, from, from some exploration with regards to the corporations, I mean, to, to the cooperatives. So I'm still struggling to, to, to go beyond that, uh, that point, you know, a point on the historical developments of, 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 this, of these discussions. Because my fear is that if we are going to pursue uh, the issue of establishment of gap uh, cooperatives and the, the, the community uh, energy cooperatives, what is going to happen within the net lag processes? What is, what is going to happen at the level of the community chamber? You know, because if those, uh, those uh, initiatives will have to be managed and controlled by the communities, obviously the net lag processes has got to be controlled or it has got to be led by, by the community chamber at the helm. Now the question becomes, uh, you know, the issue of uh, skills. Comrade Wilde was talking about the issue of skills and the sitters. When I think about the sitters, 
I don't want to be tempted to think about funding only, but unfortunately, that's, that is the situation we find ourselves in. You know, the issue of skills, what do we mean by skills and what kind of an economy, you know, that we're building those uh, skills for. With regards to the cooperatives, I had thought that all the cooperatives, all the sitters in South Africa will prioritize the cooperatives. You know, all the different uh, sector, uh, uh, you know, sitters will have cooperatives as their focus. Now, given all this historical background or the, the what is it, the, the north, the historical north that we have in terms of cooperatives, you know, some call those uh, projects in the provinces, but there hasn't been a clear program to upskill and to resource, you know, such initiatives. You know, if we're going to talk about energy, for instance, you know that everybody's mind, particularly those in government and those in business, think about the IPPs and nothing else. Mm. You know, there are, new, there are new malls that are being built. I know, for instance, I'm staying in King Williamstown. There's a mall, they call it the retail park, which is going to be built in uh, in, in Baza or around in Baza, around there. But the issue nobody's talking about energy, energy supply in a, in a, in a, in a very clear way. But we know that there are IPPs and there are people who, who have to use animal waste to produce electricity. But it's something that is flying up there. You know, it's something that is flying up there at a strategic level or at a political level. Right? So, so the question of involving communities in such projects worries me a lot. And it has to do with, with, with the ideological perceptions around cooperatives. I attempted to ask somebody at some point, but I didn't get a clear answer as to why the skepticism around the establishment, support, encouragement, and all of those kinds of things for cooperatives in South Africa. What could be the ideological or political issues behind that? So I haven't managed to resolve that. But uh, let me leave that and sort of think about solution-based kind of uh, propo uh, uh, proposals. These, these kinds of things somehow demand a class action in a way, a class action which will sort of make a voice that there are no middle class or academic people or clever people behind us as communities. Mm -hmm. We want this as part of a compensation. I know for a fact I was staying in Wazakel, I grew up there. And there's been all sorts of theories around why people are having some chest related problems and all of those kinds of things. And uh, my work with IHRG and IHU and ICEP gave me a sense of what is actually happening in terms of occupationally transmitted diseases to the communities. So therefore there are grounds for a convincing class action by people from around such areas, the gap, the gap taps, the fuel, uh, the fuel uh, pro uh, production as a, uh, power stations and all of that. So I was thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we collect all the necessary information and, and say boldly that, well, these, these were uh, establishments by the apartheid government. And therefore there should be some kind of a compensation. There should be some kind of a comment. So that demands a class action in a way. So I don't know, I just want to throw that and look at the skills. Should there be any possibility of support then we can start to look at the skills and what made other cooperatives, including the savings clubs in the townships, what, what could be the problem behind their collapse? So for, I'm, sure, I'm sure you are hearing that my mind is also, because there, there, there are also there, there, there are a number of historical issues that have never been resolved around uh, cooperatives. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, I think, thanks very much, Com. Um, I think the issue of why co-ops succeed and fail was absolutely crucial to this discussion. And maybe this is a good point to bring in, in Luca. I'm gonna take Luca and Chris, Christopher, but Comrades, can you just also keep it a bit uh, tight? Uh, just okay. mindful of time. Um, Luca, I should just mention is a post-grad and part of his, his master's is actually looking at union-based co-ops and the ideological arguments. So. Luca, I'm not expecting you to present your research here. Just uh, the floor is yours. How does it go? Far Can away. you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Go for okay. it. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm actually of the same feeling as Mike, man. I, I have such a strong uh, leniency on to cooperators. But I have just two simple questions. Um, the first question is, uh, how, how do you envision dealing with a private enterprise competition? Because I'm thinking, I was looking at the, at the power station that you have there, and I was thinking, 
especially on the supply side of the uh, the so-called um, what you call the input supply of biodigesters and the solar panels. So I'm thinking, how do you how do you deal with the competition of other firms that may want to supply the same things at a different say rating that you know the core of itself might not be able to supply and the other aspect of this question is what if now you have the state uh, issuing uh, licenses to supply these things on a wholesale to the core of you see throwing in there a bit of corruption and nepotism i mean patronage from the state because i saw that you are very uh, what you call settled with the relationship you have with the state um, and the second question that I have is, uh, are the household mainly in, in, in the township, uh, are they female-headed or male-headed or both or child-headed uh, household? And is, is gender any uh, uh, factor that plays a role in, in that uh, mix of developing these cooperatives? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Luca. Um, Christopher? Christopher here. Uh, Christopher Bartman, do you still? Uh, good evening, all. How are you doing? Cool, man. Floor is yours. Uh, cool. I would, uh, sorry, I'm having a bit of a connection problem, but I would like to commend you guys on a project. It's a great project. Uh, one of my concerns is, as an individual, um, how do we get, uh, how do we interact with you guys on this project? Are there means of us getting involved in this project in some way? Okay. Thanks, Chris, Christopher. Uh, okay, uh, Janet, there, there's quite a bunch. So I, I think just uh, take the ones you can do. Um, I think Wayne has mostly been covered in the comments. And also use this to make uh, your closing comments, uh, Janet. And then I, I don't think we're going to be able to do it another round. Floor is yours, so to speak. Thanks. So the, the first question, I mean, why you led, but this was also asked um, by Mike, is, is about the, the stigma about co-ops and people's understanding and mindset about co-ops. So, so my, my answer to this is that that we have to change that through people seeing the material benefits of the co-op. There's no other way of convincing people, but by them benefiting from the co-op. So we have to prove the model works. If it doesn't work for people, then they will be skeptical. The problem I think is that what's happened, and I think um, some other research on co-ops in South Africa, which are not the union co-ops, like the ones originated by NUM or NUMSA and so on, but the ones set up by the municipality. Uh, so they, in, in Kwasakele, for example, there's some waste cooperatives which were set up by the municipality to pick up waste, et cetera. They are set up as top-down structures mm. where they're part of this system of um, giving contracts to particular people. And what happens is that when the the municipal contract runs out, the co-op dies because it's not really a co-op. It's just an individual who's been given this contract. So we, we have to prove the, the other model of the co-op really, that it works for people. Um, I, you know, it's no good setting, getting lots of funding and, and setting things up if it's not actually delivering uh, some benefit to people. And the real issue is, is whether people can benefit the, together. I, I think the other really critical issue that, that uh, Comrade Waile asked was about the import of, of inputs into mm. PV solar. And absolutely, I mean, at the moment, cheap uh, PV solar imports are coming from China, et cetera. The cost has gone down dramatically. Uh, I think Khaled or Trevin maybe can talk about this, but I actually had some discussion with somebody from the uh, DTI a while ago about this. And he said South Africa really missed a, 
real opportunity to develop our own PV solar industry, manufacturing of PV solar. Um, but I don't think that opportunity is gone. I mean, I don't know enough about what it would take to, to create South Africa as a competitive producer of PV solar, but there's a huge market in Southern Africa. And I can't see why we couldn't, not we, but I mean, actually, why the, why the state, the Department of Trade and Industry couldn't have an industrial policy which emphasizes production of, of inputs for PV solar and the associated technology. In terms of provincial government funding, uh, IDP processes, CETAs uh, for skills development, etc. Thank you, uh, Comrade Wahile, for all those suggestions. We haven't engaged in the ward-based budgeting as yet, but I think we have to do that. We have to get this project into the IDP process. Um, uh, the, the question of car power ship, I think when, and somebody on the chat has answered that, I don't see any local benefit from car power ship, but I stand to be proven wrong. I mean, it's like any big infrastructure deal, um, even if it's a temporary thing, you know, government can negotiate it or with the local authority that's hosting it, that they get some percentage of benefit, et cetera. But I don't see that happening in the case of car partnership, but anyway, we'll see. Saki, the financial model, um, again, I take your point. I think this issue of the skill seater and skilling people to do the maintenance and installation is absolutely critical part of this. Our model is actually that the, the KDA, which is established as a, as an NPO, which is actually going to ideally sort of coordinate this as a tertiary co-op, if you like, where they would uh, liaise with the skills providers and provide training and so on at that at that level. But we, yeah, we need to to look into that and also the, the P College as well, which is is actually right there. P College uh, has a, a electrical engineering and renewable energy training diploma right next to Kwasakele in Sterndale. So we should be working more closely with them as well. Um, then Marcus, thank you for the wonder bag thing. I mean, our wonder bags are wonderful. Um, I, I, I don't know quite where it fits into this. Of course, I mean, the issue about solar is that it doesn't provide at household level enough electricity for ovens, you know, for running a, a, a stove, which is very energy intensive for baking and roasting and things. So and those are the, that's the appliance which takes up a lot of energy. So wonder bags definitely, I mean, if people it would just reduce their the expenditure on electricity for a start, as people are finding it really difficult to pay for electricity. But the model that we're using is not designed to replace municipal electricity in people's homes with solar electricity. So it's not a direct uh, thing of taking people off the grid. Uh, but yeah, so I don't know quite where the link is, where we can persuade people to reduce their electricity by, by using wonder bags, which is a, a really good idea. Um, Mike, um, I think the, the issue of the, the health, uh, the compensation for occupational disease and so on, I, I, I don't, I'll put the slide up so that you can see the old coal-fired power station here and how dirty it is. You can't actually see the manganese, but there's manganese stored in this as well and there's a big problem in PE at the moment with uh, with manganese being stored unsafely and I don't know if this is specifically what you were referring to in terms of a claim but there may there may well be a, a, a claim on behalf of residents of this area which is the sort of bottom side of Kwasi Kele. Um, I don't know quite how to take that further but we can we can discuss it, um, occupational disease, class actions, and so on. Um, 
And then Luke's very, Luke is very important question about competition from private enterprise. Um, yeah, so, so I, think the, I think the model is not that we would be competing for everything in terms of private enterprise, but it would be there's certain things that we could produce locally for local market um, where we could offer something at a competitive price. And, you know, if you think about it, if we can reduce the cost of transport and storage and advertising and packaging and all the, all the ex, extra rubbish that goes with production and distribution in a, in a competitive capitalist market, um, we should actually be able to produce certain things competitively. I don't think everything, seriously. I mean, I don't think they're going to be companies which can produce things with technology and at scale, which we, which we wouldn't even get close to producing. The state, whether the state will supply things and um, buy them at special rates and <laughs> their own tender system, etc. cetera. Uh, we haven't got there yet. Uh, it's, it's something we would have to think very carefully about how we engage with state tender processes in terms of inputs into the system. As you say, uh, you said we have a settled relationship with the local state, but it's not actually very settled. There's a lot of questions still open about how we engage with the, the municipality. Um, and female-headed households, yes, there, there is a mixture male and female headed households in Kwazakere. Uh, there's actually, interestingly enough, it, it doesn't have a, a lot of uh, migrant labor. It's quite stable family households. So there are a lot of women in Kwazakere, a lot of uh, female headed households. The, the, the co-op at the moment, the, the active members are actually, most of them are men, unemployed men who live there. But the members are also women. So I would say there's an, probably an equal number of women members of the self Huber co -op. And yeah, Chris, Christopher's question about how to interact with the project. I think we must just put you, you must just get in touch with us and uh, we'll, yeah, we can, we'll talk afterwards. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Janet. Um, I think we, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, two, two things. One, uh, I think what this all raises, looking at also some of the comments that have been made, on the one side, it's very positive to, to see the sort of self-activity and uh, vibrant civil society that you can build around these projects. Uh, I think this is something which, as uh, Zonak Lolo and that noted, is, is actually being quite, uh, quite undermined. But the thing that also gets raised, um, and this is partly in Luca's comment, it's partly in the issue of modes of engagement with the state, it's partly with Nklantler's comment, is how do you engage in the state? And it's partly in relation to what you just said now, Janet. How do you, how do you engage with the state without losing your autonomy? How do you avoid getting drawn into competition for resources, into patronage politics, and the sort of pacification that, that does take place where people uh, see the state as something that will deliver, something that you demand, and then how do you get it to a situation where people's self-activity is maximized? So on the one side, you want to engage the state to access its resources. You don't want to go live in the mountains and hope that the state will disappear and, and so on, or capitalism will disappear if we all sort of have an exodus. But on the other hand, how do you deal with the logic of the state, which is often a very top-down one, and at odds with the sort of bottom-up democratic logic you see in cooperatives. So I think that's just a it's just a general point. It's a contradiction that we need to think through, and it's a challenge we I think engage every single day. So Janet, thank you very much uh, for all your input. Thank you everybody for all the many points. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we are are having our next seminar on the sixth. I've put um, the details in the um, in the comments and I'm going to just put them up now. You should be able to see same storm, different boat, COVID-19 precarity in the South African labor market. And this will be looking at 
the differentiated impacts of the pandemic uh, recession on informal and precarious employment by gender, status in employment, and industry sector. So I'd like to welcome you all to that uh, next time, if you can make it on the 6th. Again, I'd like to thank everybody who attended. Let everybody know we will be putting up a recording of this, an edited one. We will be adding the names that we've got to our mailing list for future activities. Thank you again for all your time. Thank you again for all your comments and making yourselves available. With that, Thank you I'm very much. going to close the meeting and uh, enjoy your evenings. Thanks. Thanks, Lucien. Thanks. Thanks very much. Ooh, thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Hey. I'm the Amanda List. <laughs> Who is a fundamentalist? Come on, don't don't throw these labels around, comic wise. <laughs> okay, cheers, guys. Cheers, cheers guys. guys.